uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. And uh, I think there was a reason why I speak first. Let's get physics out of the way. <laughs> that, that is basically my, my task here. So I will talk to you about the project, uh, how the ML Linux, which is a specific machine, uh, promises to deliver a new era in personalized radiation therapy. It's now. Ah. Yeah. I said, you know, I have one mic here, and I said, ah, oh, that's good enough. Um, I try it again, but but I, I don't repeat it. So that's the title of of my talk, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. And it is actually I'm privileged to be here the second time uh, already, and I thought, well. I would fulfill some expectations and I want uh, that you get to know me a little bit better too. So my passion for physics and what do physicists like, and this is really big machines. So I, I worked at, a, at a Cyclotron in Canada for seven years and you could hear our particles accelerated. Of course this person isn't there when this is an operation, it's just a cleaning. And the second thing, what do you think do physicists love? Equations. Yeah. And so I, I thought I'd put uh, a few in this talk, and these are very famous equations. These are the Maxwell equations, which are basically telling you that uh, the sources of the electric field are electrical charges, that there are no magnetic fields which are not closed, and that there are electromagnetic waves. And this is a tremendous impact on your life because it gives you light and radiation and everything. And why does this have anything to do with cancer? Well, first, it's a 150-year anniversary. They were discovered these equations by Maxwell, who was also founding the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge. And this person certainly deserves the Nobel Prize for this work, but he didn't get it. He didn't get it because he died of cancer, of stomach cancer, when he was 48. So this is one motivation coming from the physics side. The second one is more personal. And I'll show you here my dad. Well, yeah, he is 90, he is enjoying his birthday, you see. He has this little present there. And he was diagnosed with head and neck cancer when he was 85. He went through radiation therapy, through chemo, and he's doing fine. You know, he had his 91st birthday this year. And of course, one motivation in addition to this, I want that my son doesn't have to go to this kind of treatments. So there's a lot of personal um, motivation here, and uh, now I'm going on with the real stuff. What do we want? We want dose conformality, which means dose only in the tumor, radiation dose, and not anywhere else where it can cause damage. And you could imagine this kind of painting artwork. You can do it by drawing straight lines, and there you have a concentration of dose, and you want to spare the eyes of this figure. Translating this to head and neck cancer, there is a treatment of a patient. You see here two tumor targets wrapping around the optic nerve and an eye, and by delivering these intensity modulated radiation fields, you can see here how the dose is building up, and you can see we really succeed in delivering a therapeutic dose to the tumor and we spare this organ at risk. So there's a lot of technology involved, but that is possible. But what are our weaknesses? And before I go through this, just to reiterate, so we have conformal concentration of dose in tumors, conformal avoidance of dose in organs at risk, and for that, we have to increase the geometrical accuracy of the dose delivery. And this will lead to increase in tumor control and reduction of toxic side effects. So this is, and well, what is happening? Image-guided radiation therapy, this is the key we are working on now. And this is exactly, if you put a patient on a treatment couch, this is what you will see from the inside of the patient. Absolutely nothing. It's dark. We have an invisible beam and an invisible target. And now we have to switch somehow the light on. And why is that important? And I will see you, uh, I will show you uh, 
how to switch sunlight on. This is a treatment plan which was designed here, uh, outlined this volumes of interest where you put your radiation and where you shouldn't put your, radi your, your radiation. And let's say we tailor this treatment plan according to that it's best for the patient. Unfortunately, these patients are changing during treatment, and you can see this here. All of a sudden, you see these contours there in air, and whatever we have planned is not optimal and is obsolete at the time of the treatment. Uh, there's another problem. If we want to look into a patient, which we can do in the moment with x-rays, directly prior to therapy, the image quality is really not good enough. And here you see an MRI image, which is basically revealing much more detail, and you can draw these contours on these images. But it didn't exist so far that you could take MRI images during or directly uh, prior to treatment. So we need treatment machines that can see what we treat, and the Amolinog is one of these machines, or it's the first machine. So that is it, um, and you see here, there's an MRI scanner inside, and there's a treatment unit circling around. And before I go into this picture, I think a video usually can show this quite nicely. You will see there's the MRI scanner, there are the magnetic fields which allow us to do imaging of the patient. And why we are having these electromagnetic fields there, there is the radiation beam, these are electrons, high-speed electrons hitting a target, producing the radiation, which you then can put under image guidance into a patient. And this is how the machine looks like. Um, you know, that was, of course, just a design study and more a PowerPoint uh, presentation. There you see the dose delivery system, the MRI scanner, and you can have this now at the same time, conceptually. And why is this so important? Here you see the image quality. Uh, admittedly, this is a prostate patient, but these are the images which we have available now. And this is simply not good enough for good image guidance. These are just shadows of electron densities. However, we could replace them with these kind of images where you see every anatomical detail right at the time of the treatment. And here I just show you what you could do. For instance, if the tumor is moving, you could tailor the radiation fields directly according to the moving tumor. And you follow the movement of any tumor, of any anatomical change you observe directly with the radiation beam. And uh, so the anatomical correctness, I think, is tremendously improved individually for each patient. However, we are also looking at the next generation. I don't know, does anybody know what this is? This is, you're, you are not looking lots of TV like my son does. This is a Stargate, you know, a Stargate where you go into different worlds and the device we have now looks very, very similar. You, know, you go to a different dimension of treatment, basically, with this kind of a device. And uh, what can you do with this, with functional imaging? Uh, you could actually now not only look at the anatomy, but you could assess treatment response. For instance, does the, does the oxygen concentration change under treatment? And what does it mean for treatment? Or what if there is not enough oxygen, do we have to increase the dose in order to make this treatment a success? So there are so many options in the future to improve current clinical practice for many clinical indications with this kind of technology that uh, Kevin and myself and many others at the Institute have um, spent quite a bit of effort to get the first of this machine here at the ICR in the UK. And uh, so the architects of the Remarsden envisioned something like that of the new facility about three years ago. And uh, yeah, that will now take a while. There are preparation rooms and uh, then you're going through this uh, facility, 
and at some time the magic door should open. I hope, yeah, it does. And then, yeah, so that was how it was envisioned. And I would just show you that we are very, very close to being uh, ready to use this facility. It was quite a bit of way. I, was, I remember sitting in the Sutton Council meeting for, to get planning permission to build this facility in 2014. Then there was groundbreaking construction, the delivery of the equipment, and now we are very close to have the first radiation beam, and I will show you an example. In 15 seconds, how to make a big hole and <laughs> fill it up again. So this was um, the construction site. It is now, now all closed, and uh, we have spent the money which we won for, for building this, basically. Uh, here you see the delivery. It was actually a movie of a drone uh, which uh, is in a couple of hundred meters. Here you see this huge crane. There's my Stargate flying into this opening. <laughs> and uh, so that we have the facility, or the first biggest part of the facility. Then the next part was, there is uh, the rotating gantry, there's the magnet, and how it's put all together. And you know, it was the first time that the chief operating officer of the Royal Marsden was coming on a Saturday with a bottle of champagne to make the, to watch this and, and she was actually there. And as you can see here, that doesn't mean a lot to you, but for me it's extremely exciting. There's a piece of film which was irradiated with the radiation source of the Amalinak and we blocked out the abbreviations of our two institutes, ICR and RMH. So on the 3rd of October, uh, last Monday, we had the first beam in this facility. And uh, with this, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to thank the Oregon Foundation for their support, especially my student Jennifer, who has a poster. You can look at this a little bit later. I thank you for your attention. And physics is over now. <laughs> <laughs>